So on your quiz tomorrow, you can expect um, what we've done um, before what I'm about to show you. So anything with combinations, permutations, counting, probability rules, all the way up to the addition rule for um, the general addition rule, all right, to what we did yesterday. So we're going to move on and look at the general multiplication rule along with conditional probability. Okay, so this is a classic example of a conditional situation. It says, what's the probability of drawing a seven of clubs, then a four of hearts without replacement? So you are changing up what we would normally see. First of all, at seven of clubs, you got it. That was your first draw and you got it. Otherwise, the problem would end there. So then you get a four of hearts and it's with the without replacement part because when you start in a regular deck of cards, you have 52 cards, two colors, four suits, 13 cards per suit and all that. Well, if you pull out a seven of clubs and don't put it back, then you go from 52 cards to 51, you have one less club, you have one less seven, the whole situation changes because of the condition that you pulled out a seven of clubs and kept it out, all right? So um, that's gonna change your independence too because if you put that seven of clubs back in and randomize the cards, then picking a card would, could be equal probability of black or white, you just don't know. But if you pull the seven of clubs out, a black card, and you don't put it back in, now you have more red cards than you have black cards and even though it's only slightly different you have some idea when you go to pick that you might it might favor a red card and that's where your um, independence just went away so we can't use the multiplication rule here because this is an and it doesn't say it but it is um, for in, uh, independent events we're gonna have to do something else but for the moment this is your conditional probability, the condition that you pulled out a seven of clubs. So um, any probability that takes into account a given condition is called conditional probability. So that's where things are going to get different, um, maybe a little harder, maybe a little weirder, but um, it's not on tomorrow's quiz. So we're not going to take tackle this on, a, on an assessment until next Wednesday, so we have a lot of time to figure it out. All right, this has nothing to do with this uh, initial bulleted point, but it's just to get the notation for you. So uh, when we want the probability of an event uh, from a conditional distribution, we write it like this. And this is the probability of event B, given that, the bar here means given that, that's the phrase, or if, or anything that implies a condition, so the probability of event B given that A occurred, all right? And we just say probability of B given A, all right? So that's different, that's new. All right, so back to our original problem, all right? So what is the probability of drawing a seven of clubs and then a four of hearts without replacement? And remember means to multiply. This is gonna be out of 52 cards, but this is gonna be out of 51, so here goes. Uh, there it is with the and, with the multiply, and there is the other part, the conditional part. So probability of drawing seven of clubs times probability of drawing a four of hearts given that the seven of clubs was drawn. And so there it is. All right, one out of 52 for the first draw, one out of 51 for the second because each of these are unique cards. And you notice that the sample space went from 52 to 51. Conditional probability inevitably will shrink your sample space. Okay, when you have a table, you can see it probably even better. Because here we're doing a, an interaction between political views and gender. Here's your grand total, the 137. Here's your marginal distribution for gender. Here's your marginal distribution on the bottom for political views. And if you're asked, what is the probability that you draw from these folks randomly and get a female? That's a simple probability question. It's 77 out of 137. If you wanna go for the joint probabilities and all these three, or I'm sorry, six uh, uh, 
events here in the middle of the table, those are all joint uh, situations. Like this is the intersection of moderate and male. This is the intersection, let's go with this number, of conservative and female. So the probability of female and liberal, all right, these are those folks that have both of those qualities. So that's 30 out of 137. But the question becomes, what is the probability that a selected student has a moderate political viewpoint given that we have selected a female? So given that means it happened, you've picked a female, the next thing you have to do is check uh, her political views to see if you made a hit, like if you had a success. So if you're selecting a female, you're looking at this row right here, and does male really matter at that point? I mean, you picked a female, you're not picking again, so the males are gone. This shrinks your table down to just this condition, just the females, period. So um, moderate is 24, total is 77, that's what it shrunk to, so 24 out of 77 and it's this. And so remember the 3.11? All right, this is just a restatement of the notation. Whoops, that went a little out of order. Okay, so your definition for conditional probability. So the probability of B, given that A occurred, is gonna equal the joint probability, probability of A and B, over the probability of whatever the second event or the conditional event happens to be. So in this case, it's the probability of A. You get that fraction and you get that conditional probability. So if you switch these and you have the probability of A given B, that would put B in the conditional spot and put B here. Anyway, so in our previous example, that's the probability of a moderate and female over a female. and Remember the females were 77 over, over 137. Here's 24 out of 137. That's gonna give you your conditional probability that we saw. And that's gonna be 0.311-ish, right? Same thing. All right, just a quick review. Um, remember when we had a multiplication rule for independent events, we learned that first day pretty much, maybe second day, and it was just the probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B, and this is just the same thing with, um, you know, that intersection symbol replacing and, but it's the same thing, and this is for when events are independent, remember? Knowing that one thing happens doesn't tell you what's coming next. All right, so here is your general multiplication rule down here. General means it works for if your events are dependent or independent, all right? And it's almost the same thing as what you were just looking at in the previous slide, except this term probability of B in the pre previous one became the conditional probability of B given A. Now, if your conditional is going to be featuring B as the condition, then it does change a little bit, but essentially we're dealing with the same thing. Okay, just you're featuring A is the condition here, B is the condition here. Now, if you go ahead and divide like this up here, this top one, both sides by the probability of A, you get the previous probability, which is that. Okay, so dividing each side by the probability of A gives you the definition for the probability of B given A. So this is the same formula as this, they're just algebraically manipulated. All right, we're not doing reversing the condition. I think that's just a little too much for today. We'll get to it. All right, that thing about independence, remember you pull out the card and you lose your independence? Remember, the probability of B given A is the probability of A and B over the probability of A. That's the third or fourth time you've seen it. Now, if A and B are independent, you can replace this with the other part of our original formula. So you can put probability of A times the probability of B and replace that joint probability when they're independent. 
And if you notice, you have a probability of A in both the numerator and denominator. Those two things cancel out. And so you get the probability of B given A, you know, that conditional just equals the non-conditional. And that's when events are independent. So if you can identify this as happening in your situation, and you can show that those two things have the same value, then that's going to answer the question, are A and B independent? So that's one way to do it. Now the one way you don't do it is to say, well, you know, um, if A happens, I don't really think B will. It might, but I don't think so. So I'm just going to say they're independent. No, 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 no. It's not up to interpretation. You do the math. And there's also another way to show independence. We've done it before. All right, here's the way you just saw when the conditional equals the non-conditional, right? And it works for the other version of the conditional. Or if you can show that our original formula for, uh, what is it, multiplication rule for independent events, if you can show that that is a true equation, like this product equals this joint probability, then you can say, again, that A and B are independent. So it's this way in the blue, this way in the black. All right, so that's the homework and uh, hold on for just a few minutes because I need to change up what I'm doing here, but I will be right back. So pause just for a second. All right, hey folks, um, I'm back. This is page 10 in your packet, so you might want to pause for a moment while you get there. Um, I just want you to see this whole new uh, thing in action. Um, you're going to get a bunch of different sort of viewpoints on it. So um, this is just, you're looking at a table with the interaction of age, you know, reading down and marital status from, <clears throat> excuse me, left to right. And I'm going to work this with a kind of a formality that I hope that you'll ad adopt because not that I want you to do extra work and just be way over the top with details or anything, but I just find that if you handle with a certain amount of precision, you know, the easier this kind of thing gets. And I just kind of want this to be easy for you. So there's a bunch of things we could define as event A, but what I chose, I'm just going to let A be the event that if I reach in there and pick out a person at random, the person is um, 30 to 64 years old. All right, and that's a very easy probability for us to come up with. So the probability of A, let's see, 30 to 64, that would be this number here over this number, right? So let's just get those off of there. All right, so this is going to be 62,689 divided by 103,000, whoops, that should be 103, so there needs to be a zero there. So 103,870. And that'll give us, if we just get that to four decimal place, 0 0.6035. Okay, the reason that I went and defined A like this and went to all that trouble is when I get to the end of this, if I need to find out the probability of B given A, and I forget what I assigned to A, then I'm going to have a problem. If I have it all written out, I can just glance up and see it. All right, so for event B, um, I'm just going to call B the event that um, a person is married. All right, and the probability of that, probability of B, all right, married is over here. So that's 59,920 over the total there, 103,870. So we'll figure out what that is. So 59,920 over 103,870. And to four decimal places, 0 0.5769. Okay, great. So we're going to work with those two um, events. 
And then for number three, although you know this is a stretch, because isn't it pretty much true that all of these tables are never independent? So we're going to assume that they are, and that's going to enable us to kind of play around with the old formula, which is that the probability of A and B, multiplication rule for independent events, is the probability of A times the probability of B, which we know because we just found them. So that's 0 0.6035 times 0.5769. And if you multiply those out and round, 0.3482. All right, but remember that we don't need a formula to get the intersection of A and B. It's going to be right up here. So um, being 30 to 64 and being married would be this number. So if I put that over this, I should get the joint probability. And that's what I'm going to do. So according to the table, let's do that. All right, I wish I could be like that person on the other video that I posted because that guy writes fast. There's a way to speed it up. I just don't know how to do it. Um, what did we say? That's the probability, the actual probability of A and B because the table doesn't lie. That's your 43,808 over your total, 103,870. And that'll give you 0.4218. And that is different from this, right? So when this, uh, this formula for um, the multiplication rule for independent events fails you when it gives you a bad answer, that's just showing you that events A and B are not independent. That's one way to show it. All right, so there you go. Now they want us to go ahead and calculate the probability of B given A, all right? Now, do you remember what A is? It's the person is 30 to 64 years old. I know that because I wrote it, okay? And since that is a condition, that's gonna shrink our table or our sample space down to just this condition. All right, so we don't even have to pay attention to these folks because we clearly were given that we drew a person from this list and we need the probability that that person is married, B given A. So that's 43,808 over 62,689. All right, so we can get that probability. So 43,808 over 62,689. and that'll give you 0.6988. Okay, remember from the PowerPoint that, let me change colors here real quick. If this ends up being equal to this, then your events are independent, but this is different from this. So that's just the second way that we can say, okay, mathematically, these are not independent because when the joint, I'm sorry, when the conditional probability equals the non-conditional probability, you have independence. Here we, it's not equal, so we don't. That's just another way to do it. But we also need this for what comes next because our original, you know, our old multiplication rule failed us because this is wrong. So we're going to go to this new and improved general multiplication rule, all right? So this is gonna stay that the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A, which is at the top, times the probability of B given that A occurred. So the probability of A is up here, 0.6035. And the probability of B given A is right here, that's 0.6988. And what we're shooting for is this. We want it to equal that in order 
to have a formula that really gives us the right answer. It'll be a little bit off because of the rounding to four places. It's 0.4217. Let's just call it the same thing. And so this is an improvement. It is an improvement. It'll work when events are independent because the probability of B given A will just be the probability of B. So there you go. Happy time. All right, as far as the dependency here, do you happen to notice, and let me just grab a different color here, that your young people aren't married quite as much as the other group, and your middle-aged people kind of go for the divorce a lot more than these folks do? I, I'm sure there are other things that would set up a dependency, but for us, that's kind of the, the major thing, all right? So this just shows you that this new formula works. So I'm going to pause again, and we're going to go on to page 11. So hang on. All right, we're near a wrap here. This shouldn't take too long. Um, this is another table, and it doesn't feature counts. It just fe features the actual probabilities within here, and all of these are joint probabilities. So we're kind of missing the marginal distribution and the grand total. So um, it just, it's all about a certain model of car that's available in several different styles. Um, Two-door, four-door, and hatchback, you can get that along with an automatic and a manual. So remember, like a two-door can come two ways, either automatic or manual, or means plus, so that adds up to 0 0.40, okay? And we can keep going like that. That's a scary looking. Point. All right, and this is going to be 0 0.31, and this is going to be 0 0.29, and we're hoping that this will just add up to 1. Get a little bit bigger brush size here. And um, going across here, these two things should equal 1. This is 0 0.08, 0 0.08 plus 0 0.04 is 0 0.12, plus 0 0.11 is 0.23. And if that means this has to be 0.77. Okay, so now they can't throw too much at us that we can't figure out. Um, the first one here is actually pretty easy. So I'm just going to go ahead and not start with symbols here, A's and B's. It says, what's the probability this customer has purchased a car with an automatic transmission? All right, there's three ways to do it. So the probability of an automatic... All right, you can get it as a two-door, so 0.32, or plus a four-door, 0.27, or plus a hatchback, and that'll give you your 0.77. Then they want to know the probability of a four-door, and there's two ways to get a four-door. You can get it uh, with an automatic, so that's 0.27, or you can get it with a manual, so that's 0.04, and you get what you would expect, 0.31. Okay, not a big thing. Okay, what's going to be a little bit tr tough is that all of the rest of them, except the very last one, start with given that. All right, so we're dealing with conditional probability. So given that a customer purchased a four-door car, so I'm just going to let event A be a four-door. Okay, what's the probability that it has an automatic transmission? So I'm going to let event B be an automatic. And what we want is the conditional probability, which would be the probability of B given A. And if you're sharp with this, you'll remember, because we only saw it like a hundred times, the formula for it is the probability of A and B over the probability of whatever this number is right here, A. A number, actually event, it's not a number. All right, so let's put in the numbers. Four door, all right, four door is got this. There's two ways you can get it. It adds up to 0.31. I'm not gonna write it all out, but let's just put 0.31 there. And then A and B will be the intersection of a four-door and an automatic, right? That's going to be the 0.27. All 
okay? And if you change that into a decimal, that's 0.8710. All right, that's pretty easy. What's even easier is if you opt out of doing all of the formulas and the symbols and all that, if they say the probability of an automatic, given that it's a four-door, doesn't that mean that shrinks your sample space to just this, right? So you don't need to worry about the two-door, you don't need to worry about the hatchback, this is your world now. As soon as you're you get that condition, that's it. So this is basically four door over total. That's it. I'm sorry, check that, automatic over total because that's the intersection that we want of four door and automatic. So it's this number over this number, automatically, okay? So that's kind of neat. I could have done that really without messing around with all the symbols, but I like the symbols. So we're gonna keep doing them. So number three, um, you can pause this and try it on your own, but I'm just gonna work it. So given that a person purchased a manual transmission car, so I'm gonna call event A manual. Uh, what's the probability that it's a hatchback? So event B will be a hatchback. And again, we've got the given that. So this is again the probability of B given that A occurred. And again, that's the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. All right, so let's see. The probability of A in this case is a manual. All right, so the manual will be 0.23. That's the total probability for all three ways that it can come. So 0.23 in the denominator, and then the intersection of manual and hatchback. All right, the intersection of manual and hatchback is this number right here, 0.11. Okay, so that will go to 0.4783. But again, you could have done this the quick way because if the condition is that you're in a manual transmission car, then that restricts you to just this right here. And it'll be hatchback over, hatchback and manual over manual. There it is, 0 0.11 over 0 0.23. So good times. All right, now this number four may be a little bit tricky. All right, it says, given that the customer did not purchase a hatchback, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say that event A is a hatchback. I know it sounds like a contradiction, but you'll see why I'm doing it. And then what's the probability the car has a manual transmission? All right, so manual, okay. So again, it's a given that, so it's the probability. Now you gotta think about this. A customer did not purchase a hatchback. I'm calling A, a hatchback. If they did not purchase it, it's not really A, it's A complement. So it's B given that not A occurred, all right? And again, when you go to write out the formula, you gotta be consistent. So this is the probability of A complement and B over the probability of A complement. Interesting. All right, so if they did not purchase a hatchback, then they must have purchased the other two, right? So we're talking about this. All right, so um, the denominator here, the probability of not A, is the sum of these two things. So that's 0.4 over 0.31. I'm sorry, 0.4 plus 0.31. And then the probability of not a hatchback and a manual transmission, that would be the sum of these two things, the 0 0.08 and the 0 0.04. So 0 0.08 plus 0 0.04. And when you do all of that work, you get 0 0.4, um, 
let's see, 0 0.1690. Okay, I hope that made sense with the compliments and everything. Um, yeah. Now, for number five, we can go and just do this and do this and do this. But I think there's an interesting little thing that you can catch on to. It says, given that a customer produced, or I'm sorry, produced, nice, that would be nice, purchased a two door or a four door, what is the probability that the car has an automatic transmission? Well, think about that. If the customer purchased a two-door or a four-door, that's the same customer or the same type of customer that did not purchase a hatchback. So aren't we still in this condition right here? And in problem number four, they purchased a manual transmission, but in this one, they're purchasing an automatic transmission. So we're in the same condition. We're doing a different kind of transmission. Isn't that the complement, right? So the answer to this one is one minus what we had right here, 0 0.1690, and that'll give you 0 0.8310. That's pretty neat. If you remember your complement rule, that'll save your bacon. Uh, we could have gone you know, and defined all of these things, or we could have just gone the easy way and said, okay, um, here's your total, 0.71, and they bought an automatic, and that should add up to what, 0.59, so 0.59 over 0.71 should give you this number. So either way, whatever, however you wanna do it. All right, the last thing is, and it's not a trick question, maybe it is, What's the probability that a customer purchased a hatchback, a two-door, or a four-door? And most everybody caught on within about two seconds. That would be one, because that's a complete sample space. You have no other options, right? So that covers everything. That's what we learned, okay? So do the homework. I don't think we'll check it tomorrow because of the quiz, but we will check it on Friday and then we'll do tree diagrams. So pretty excited about that. So um, I hope that this was useful. I'm gonna sign off now and I will see you soon.